Hello and welcome to Ogle by Sea Churches Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join me as we continue to read Deuteronomy, which is our book for September 2023. We ought to pray, and then we're going to dive in. We've only reached chapter 4, and we've got a lot to get through. So please would you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you now, and we ask that you would speak to us from your word. We know that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from your mouth. So please feed us. Please give us life and strengthen us in Christ. In his name, amen. Amen. Right, so hopefully you can remember the setting. This is after the 40-year wandering in the wilderness because of the disobedience and unfaithfulness of the nation of Israel. They <coughs> finally... The second generation comes to the verge of the promised land once again. Moses isn't going to go in himself, but he sums up everything that the Lord would have him relay to God's people. And this is the book of Deuteronomy. So it's Moses speaking, summing everything up as in preparation for this new generation with Joshua at the lead to bring them in. So chapter 4 verse 1. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. And hear and listen is an important phrase which comes up throughout Deuteronomy. Are you listening? Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. So listening to and following the Lord is what will determine success and that is true not only for them coming into the promised land but it is true in life listening and following the Lord is what will determine success do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you you saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor the Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor but all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. And I think that's referring to the Moabites uh, <clears throat> and the whole episode with uh, Balaam. He was involved there. Verse 5. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to, to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them in the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? What other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Familiar familiarity breeds contempt. There was a danger that they took for granted the precious things that they had, this great privilege of knowing the living God, to having them with him, that he would listen to them, he would go before them, and he instructed them how to live. Don't take it for granted. Only be careful, and watch yourselves closely, so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen, or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children, and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, Horeb is another name for Sinai, the mountain of the Lord. When he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. That's another theme. It comes in the category of listening to the Lord. As you listen to the Lord, you ought to know that this is more than just yourself listening and following the Lord, that you want other people to listen and follow the Lord. There is uh, there's this um, dynamic where you know that the Lord is worthy 
and that he brings light and life and that he his ways are love so of course teach your children and of course be a light to the nations it all comes from listening you want others to hear verse 11 you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. <laughs> then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. This is interesting, isn't it? Because it's in Exodus chapter 3, where the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself, who we know is Jesus, he spoke to Moses out of a bush that was on fire but not burning up. And he said that I'm going to bring you back with my people to this mountain to worship me. And so it happened. And the angel of the Lord wasn't just on the mountain in a fiery bush. The whole mountain was on fire. And the unseen Lord, the Lord Most High, descended upon the mountain. Verse 12. Then, then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you were to follow in the land that you were crossing the Jordan to possess. You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore watch yourselves very carefully, so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, or like any animal on earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground, or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them, and worshipping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. <laughs> but as for you, the Lord took you out, and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Again, fiery imagery. They're brought to this uncreated fire, this divine fire on the mountain, but they are brought but in Christ the fire is safe, and they're brought out of that situation which is described as an iron smelting furnace and when we were reading Daniel the other month I was thinking about that how a lot of the exile and the return to the promised land is like a second exodus and that's kind of why uh, it's because of this imagery of the fiery furnace of Egypt verse 21 the Lord was angry with me that's what Moses said. The Lord was angry with me because of you. And he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as, an in, as your inheritance. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan, but you are about to cross over and take possession of that good land. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, in our fallibility, how we are prone to sin, that's the inclination of our fallen human nature, jealousy is an awful thing. Whereas, in the perfection of God, jealousy is an expression of his holy love. And you get a glimpse of this, there's a Monty Python sketch uh, where you have, um, what's his name, Eric something? Um, anyway, he comes in uh, with his wife to a marriage counselling session and he's just sat there pretty pathetically while his wife is hooking up with the counsellor or the doctor. And he just, <laughs> you can see that he's... Uh, he does care, but he, he doesn't really care that much. And that's not a picture of true love. He, he certainly doesn't love his wife. Like Jealousy 
is a right expression of love in particular situations. And this covenant relationship that Israel had established with the Lord, or the Lord established with his people, I should say, then there is this loving commitment and idolatry, worshipping other gods, which are no gods at all, really, that is going to stir God's anger. Because his anger, in that context, this jealousy, is an expression of his love for his people. So there's a severe warning. Verse 25. After you have had children and grandchildren have, and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and arousing his anger, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you this day that you, that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But if from, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And Jeremiah, well, all the prophets are really harking back to Deuteronomy uh, and the rest of the Torah and they're applying it to the specific situations they find themselves ministering in that Jeremiah lived at the time when this had unfolded in the life of Israel uh, and Judah and Jerusalem for that matter and Jeremiah ministered right at the cusp of the exile when they had been unfaithful to the Lord and constantly testing his patience, and then there was enough, and then judgment came, and they were scattered among the nations. And there's a promise in Jeremiah which echoes this sentiment. If you, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, Jeremiah says from the Lord. And here it is said, centuries ahead of time, Verse 30 then, when you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you'll, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors which he confirmed to them by oath. So there's like generations and generations. This is like a huge story of history. And it's just mentioned well, well ahead of time. Verse 32. Ask now about the former days, long before your time, from the day God created human beings on the earth. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything so great as this ever happened, or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire? I need to click on... That it says, or of a God, speaking out of fire, as you have and lived. Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth he showed you his great fire and you heard his words from out of the fire. Because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you, and to bring you into their land, to give it to you for, an, for your inheritance as it is today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today, so that it may go well with you, 
and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Uh, sometimes people think uh, that um, it came up in conversation uh, the other day, how maybe Christianity has got part of the truth and the other world religions have got part of the truth, but in reality there is a greater truth that links them all together. There is an even greater supreme being that is expressed in Christianity and expressed differently in the other world religions. And it's a popular uh, kind of parable, a popular way of looking at the world. And I think it comes from uh, the intent is trying to get along, trying to say, well, you're you're no more right than I'm right. We all have our different ways of doing things, but essentially we're all right. Whatever's true for you is true. However, that's not the claim of the Bible. And it doesn't, and it's not fair to Christianity or the other world religions because they all claim to have the ultimate truth. And this perspective of saying there's a greater truth that links them all together is saying that I know Christianity better than the Christians, I know Islam better than the Muslims, I know Hinduism better than the Hindus, I know I know everything better than <laughs> those who have committed their lives in devotion to these. Here is the claim of the Bible, that the Lord is God and there is no other. There is nothing above him, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Okay, back on track then, verse 41. Then Moses set aside three cities east of the Jordan, to which anyone who had killed a person could flee if they had unintentionally killed a neighbour without malice or forethought. They could flee into one of these cities and, and save their life. The cities were these, Beza in the wilderness plateau for the Reubenites, Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan, for the Manassites. We'll read more about these cities of refuge later. Verse 44. This is the law Moses set before the Israelites. These are the stipulations, decrees and laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt. We were in the valley near Beth Peor, east of the Jordan, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and was defeated by Moses and the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. They took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan. This land extended from Aroah on the rim of the Arnon Gorge to Mount Sirion, that is Hermon, and included all the Arabah east of the Jordan as far as the Dead Sea below the slopes of Pisgah. So that's the setting. This is uh, reiterating uh, the laws and commands given at Sinai or Horeb and you can learn more about these Amorite kings it's very interesting in the first three chapters that we read in our first reading session it tells you some interesting details about them but we're going to keep on reading for now chapter 5 verse 1 Moses summoned all Israel and said hear Israel again Listening is very important, and it's highlighted in Deuteronomy. Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, God wants to be known by us. The living God wants us to know him. And so he's not on some ego trip when he keeps on saying that he is the Lord and he has brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It's kind of like his slogan, but it's not because he's trying to big himself up. 
He wants to be known. And eternal life is knowing him. Verse 7. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make for yourself an image in the... Sorry, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Um, I haven't got it here, but I'm interested in <clears throat> the word misuse there. This is the Ten Commandments that were given at Sinai. And the phrasing, I think, in Exodus is, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. And it's this idea of bearing the Lord's name. And here it's saying misusing the name of the Lord. Verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, or any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The Lord has saved them from rest not to be slaves of themselves. Honour your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long, and that it may go well with you in the land your God, the Lord your God, is giving you. Apostle Paul writes, that's the first command with a promise. Verse 17, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife. You shall not you shall not set your desire on your neighbour's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. And he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness, while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and your elders came to me. And you said, The Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty. We have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. But what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says, then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go tell them to return to their tents. But you stay here with me, so that I may give you all the commands, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land I am giving them to possess. There's this link, isn't there? 
uh, how to live and where to live. These are laws to be lived out in the land. And it's interesting that the Lord recognises that well, he, he puts his stamp of approval on Israel's wish for Moses to act as a mediator. Verse 32. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. These are the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus sums up the law, quoting that verse. He says it's the greatest. That is what the Lord wants for you. He doesn't just want your stuff. He doesn't even just want your time. He wants your heart. He wants this loving relationship where you receive his great love and where you show your love to him. Verse 6. These commandments that I, gave, that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. That's I think talking about uh, the episode where they realised their water had run out and they complained. They tested the Lord. And then the Lord provided for them. Verse 17. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees and laws the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be, al and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. When the Lord 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. There's a footnote there, which we'll probably talk about devoted to destruction. The Hebrew term refers to the irrevocable giving over of things or persons to the Lord, often by totally destroying them. It's this idea of devoted to destruction. But the nuance is, um, it's not literally totally destroyed, ironically. Not always, at least. Make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you, and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. But those who hate him he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay to their face those who hate him. Therefore take care to follow the commands, decrees and laws I give you today. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine and olive oil, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. You will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childless, nor will any of your livestock be without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. That's amazing, isn't it? These days, we feel like we are slowly but surely conquering every disease, and it's a good thing. Um, hospitals were historically set up by Christians because we want to care for the body. We know the importance of people's bodies as well as their souls. And yet, it's become somewhat of a, like a, what feels like a prideful arrogance, if that's like, well, we just feel, I just get the sense that we arrogantly think that humanity has the solution to every disease, that we can scientifically solve all the problems, and there's uh, talk about using technology, like uh, downloading people's brains and uploading it to computers. And, and uh, I think Walt Disney got frozen in the hope that he would be able to live forever, they will be able to cure every disease in the future. There's this hope in humanity that we'll be able to figure it out. I just think how amazing it is that all these years prior, there was a society that was free from every disease. 
And it wasn't because of their ingenuity. It was because of their faithfulness to the Lord. And I believe that I will live in a society where there will be no more pain or mourning or death or disease, or decay of any kind. Be eternal life forever. Obviously forever, because it's eternal. But also abundant life. Yeah, that's what the Lord will give us. It's from the Lord. I mean, you'd think that if there is going to be a solution, it's going to be the one who created all life, and the source of all life. Hmm. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. You must destroy all the peoples the Lord your God gives over to you. Do not look on them with pity and do not serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. And it's a massive issue, a uh, topic of discussion about how can that be fair? I don't pretend to have the complete answer. I don't want to unduly demonise the Canaanites, but there, like today, if there was a tyrant who was oppressing people and who was doing awful abominations to innocent people, then there would be an outcry for some action against them. And you can't sit idly by while atrocities are being carried out. There's a time to step in. A time when you say enough's enough. You have to forcefully stop it. And you could talk about Hitler as an example, obviously. And I think that's not the complete uh, answer. But you have, I think if you want to throw mud at the Lord, then you would just say, well, the Lord is acting. He is carrying out the atrocity. But if you trust in the Lord, if you know him, and if you know that he's the source of life, and he is, he is love, and all his ways are good, if you start with that basis... And then you can, I mean, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I get that. But if you have that as your basis, then the Canaanites were against him and against his ways, and they were doing awful things. And the time had come, uh, which he had already told Abraham hundreds of years before, that the time would come. So they had time also to stop doing that, and they had time to turn around and to change their ways. But the time came when the Lord said, enough's enough. And out of love, he steps in. So this judgment is, again, an expression of the love of God. And that seems strange to us. But just how jealousy is an expression of love in certain contexts, so is judgment, this kind of judgment. And now maybe people wonder, you can't really believe this stuff because it's dangerous. It leads to, it, this is the cause of all wars, you know. Whereas I think, and it could be wrong on this, but I think that often uh, that claim, which is often given, like religion's the cause of all wars, is pretty baseless when you add up the numbers and you look up what the causes of wars are and how destructive those wars are. But I think there is um, there is a basis given here for the Lord's people to step in on the side of good to release people and to yeah to set people free if they're being oppressed. Anyway, it's a massive topic of discussion, I realise that.
but the outcome will be completely determined by your starting point. If you want to malign God, if you want to say, well, the Lord here is the tyrant, then you'll just justify your position by pointing to this. But if you start with the Lord being the one true God, and who is good, and who is uh, loving, and that people have the opportunity to stop doing the wickedness they were doing, and to turn and trust in him, uh, then yeah, your starting point is going to dictate where you end up, whether God is justified or whether not. Verse 17. You may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples you now fear. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until even the survivors who hide from you have perished. Do not be terrified by them, for the Lord your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into great confusion until they are destroyed. He will give their kings into your hand, and you will wipe out their names from under heaven. No one will be able to stand up against you. You will destroy them. The images of their gods you are to burn in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold on them, and do not take it for yourselves, or you will be ensnared by it, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring a detestable thing into your house, or you, like it, will be set apart for destruction. Regard it as vile and utterly detest it, for it is set apart for destruction. Right, I think we're going to leave it there for today. So we've reached chapter 8. Okay, thanks for joining me and I'll see you again soon. God bless.